Hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. Today's video we're going to be looking at the TRS-80 Model 2 again. This is part, I don't remember actually, maybe four. Previous videos we've looked at the disk drive, made sure that worked. We've looked at the power supply. I looked at the CRT module part of this thing and made sure that worked. And in the last video I tried to power this thing up as a complete unit. And while it did power on and have correct voltage rails, there was no life out of the unit. So on today's video, I'm gonna to try to revive some life into these digital boards here. This is the CPU one. We'll see if we can get this thing working. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So in the last video, when I powered this up and it didn't seem to work, I mentioned that one of the difficult things is that all of the digital cards go inside this card cage here with this back plane. And when you have cards that are stacked next to each other, troubleshooting them is that much more difficult because on most of the computers I work on, I'm used to just having direct access to both sides of the motherboard while it's powered up so I can probe around and try to figure out what the problem is. With some amount of disassembly, I can actually remove the card cage from this machine and these metal side plates do come off. So it's just the bare PCB with the slot connectors here. So in the end, I'm probably gonna have to do that. But right now I don't feel like it because you have to remove a bunch of other components just to get the screws out for this card cage. So the very first thing I'd like to do is take a look at these digital cards on the bench without having them in the card cage. So here are the three digital cards from the Model 2 that you require to get the system to at least power on. There's also a disk controller, which I took out in the last video, just because obviously that's not gonna be required for at least the initial boot up or initialization of the computer. From right to left, we have the CPU card, which also includes the serial port, which is connected to this edge connector right here. We have the video display and keyboard interface. So this has the CRT controller and the CRT plugs in right here, or maybe it's that one. And the keyboard also connects to this. So this is the keyboard interface. And then we have the RAM board, which is filled with 64K of RAM, obviously for the CPU to uh, utilize once the system boots up. All of these communicate with each other through the edge connectors here, and there is no difference between all the slots in the card chassis. Uh, the cards can be installed into any sock. It's just a complete backplane inside the case. Luckily, we have the Model 2 Technical Reference Manual, which has very detailed theory of operation and schematics for each of these cards. Looking at the schematics here for the CPU card, we see most of the edge connector, and you'll notice that this has plus 12, minus 12, plus five volts, and then ground, which is down here. So I think what I wanna do is power up the CPU card, and that's gonna allow me to check for a valid clock signal, a reset signal that's working properly, and then any other activity of the CPU. Obviously, since we don't have any RAM on here, we only have ROM, this thing will not boot all the way, but it should at least execute some code from the ROM before it tries to do a RAM test and then fails. I have a few hunches though, right off the bat, that might be an issue for the system booting. These cards communicate with each other using bus transceiver chips, and it's these ICs right here. These actually carry the data bus between the various cards. This Fujitsu chip is one of the bus transceivers. Now, it's marked with MB424, but the actual part number is the 8T26. This is a 4-bit bus transceiver, and these days, these are very rare, and they're not really used on anything ever. In a way, it's kind of funny they use these because you'll see there's 74LS logic all over this board, including this 74LS240, and some of them have 244s. But on a normal system, you would use 74LS245s in place of these, and those are 8-bit bus transceivers. You just need one of them. But for whatever reason, they use the AT26. Now, you may notice right off the bat that the pins on here really don't look so good. They're in sockets, and they're very corroded, at least these Fujitsu parts. And that's actually a very common problem with Fujitsu ICs when they're exposed to the elements. That can cause, of course, connectivity issues, especially these sockets are probably pretty junky. So I am thinking that right off the bat, these may be problematic. Now this board that I was just holding is the video board, and it's possible the system was actually trying to boot, but the video board wasn't getting any signals due to these bad transceivers or the bad sockets. Therefore, the screen never initialized, and that's what we were kind of looking for. 
The RAM board also has the same two Fujitsu chips and the pins are looking mighty black and horrible as well. So that could be a problem as well. The CPU board is using Motorola parts as opposed to Fujitsu's and these don't have the same corrosion issues on the legs. Hopefully you can see that okay. They're, they look pretty good there without any issues. Since this computer was kind of left for dead and obviously was exposed to the elements, corrosion is probably a factor in the problems we're having here. But first things first, let's troubleshoot the CPU board. Let's refer to the technical documentation for the CPU board just to see exactly what this board is doing. So obviously it performs the data processing activities, that's the CPU itself, and it supports DMA operations. It does provide the RS-232 serial ports, as I mentioned before. It provides all the timing for the system, so either two or four megahertz. There's also an eight megahertz clock for the floppy drive controller. There's a real-time clock. Now, there's no battery on this board, so obviously the real-time clock is something that is kept while the system is powered up, and you just have to set the time when you boot up the machine. It provides the control signals for the other boards. It provides the bootstrap firmware, which is a 2716 compatible ROM chip, which when powered up will start initializing all the various components of the system before it hands off to the disk controller and starts loading the operating system and the rest of the code to run the machine. It does say here that it includes self-diagnostic software on that 2K ROM. And then finally, this CPU board handles the power on and the manual reset logic. The primary large ICs here on the board are the CPU, the DMA controller, there's a serial IO chip, a CTC, which is a counter timer that's gonna be doing the real-time clock. And then finally, the ROM chip, which is this one right here. Okay, so first things first, let's figure out how to power this board up sitting right here on the bench. As I mentioned, when we look at the schematics here, there's five volts in ground, but there is also plus 12 volts and minus 12 volts. Now I don't need to worry about powering this board with those 12 volt rails because that specifically is for the serial port portion of this board. And I don't really care if that's working or not. RS-232 signaling uses plus and minus 12 volts, typically up to 15 volts actually, on those signal lines for proper operation. So we can just ignore those rails. Everything else on here is just five volt logic which means I should be able to clip my bench power supply leads here onto the five volt capacitor, whichever one it is here, to power up this whole board. So taking a look here, we can find five volts on 71 and 72 and nine and 10. All right, so the multimeter probes here are connected to virtual bench and set for continuity mode. The board is actually marked with pin 80 here. So we know that this is 72, 74, 76, 78, and 80. So this pin should connect to one of these capacitors, that's the plus side, but the plus side of this one's on the negative rail, so I know that's a minus rail. And then we have these two over here, it's not that one. And then that one has continuity. And just to confirm that this is the five volt rail, according to the schematics, also pin 10 is five volts. Two, four, six, eight, 10. There we go. Okay, so this is definitely the five volt one. Of course, we can confirm that by going from the positive rail to some of this TTL logic here. There we go. So it absolutely is the five volt rail. So that cap right there, I'm just gonna draw a little mark on it so we know that it's the five volt. Okay, bench power supply is off. I'm just gonna clip this on here. I have the bench power supply set to five volts at one amp. I don't really know how much it's gonna draw, but I don't think it's gonna be more than that. And it's a constant current supply. So of course, if it tries to draw more than an amp, it'll just uh, drop down the voltage. Here we go, let's turn it on. Okay, 700 milliamps right now on this little board. All right, the scope probe is ready to go on the virtual bench. It's hooked up to the ground lead there and we're ready to start looking at things. Okay, so the very first thing I wanna check is the reset circuit. Now people talked about this. This is the reset and power LED connector right here on the board. And people thought that maybe when it was unplugged, the system would be in reset all the time. A quick check of the schematics does confirm that is not the case. Here's the reset button. It's a momentary contact switch. What it does is it grounds the input to this gate right here, which is normally pulled up to five volts through this 10K resistor. That same five volt rail and ground line also powers up the LED, which was being powered up with the system. What this reset circuit does is kind of handle the power on reset. And there's also a little bit of complicated reset logic for the Z80 processor. Because if you reset the Z80 processor while it's at the wrong clock phase, you can actually have data corruption in the RAM. So you have to do the reset properly based on the clock signal input, just to ensure that a reset won't corrupt what's in memory. So you get like a soft reset, so to speak. Looking at the reset circuit here, this is the output right here, test point 11, and this goes to CPU and other things. 
The page is cut off because it's a way to scan on two pages, but I have a feeling that this little part of the circuit right here actually is that clock phase part of the reset signal because this very last gate here, well, it's a second to last gate, most likely has it. So let's check this signal right here. And yeah, I'm pretty sure it's this one right here. And that is the clock signal. Anyway, what we need to do is take a look at test point 11 to make sure that the reset is working properly. This signal here is the reset circuit. So when I power on the board, it should stay low for a little while and then go high as the CPU starts to execute. Here we go. We are currently at five volts per division. So one, two, three, four. It's between four and five volts, which is good enough for TTL. Here's the CPU and it's pin 26 that is reset. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's just make sure when I turn it on that the socket is good and the reset signal is coming through appropriately. Yep, okay, it looks exactly the same as that test point. Next thing that's essential for operation of a machine is a working clock signal. So let's take a look at that. And there is our clock signal and it looks good. Although I don't know what's going on with uh, the virtual bench. It's not showing what the frequency is. All right, I just had to zoom in a little bit more. As you can see down there, it's running at about four megahertz. Now there's actually the capability of this board to run at either two or four megahertz, but not sure why it would wanna run at the slower speed. Anyhow, that clock signal looks really good, no issues there. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the address lines. This is address line zero, so the one that should toggle the most. And I'm gonna power cycle the board. I should really hook up a reset button to it. Okay, so it just immediately goes to this, and we don't actually see it doing anything else. Let's just check out the next one. I wanna see some activity that's more than just um, a continual pattern like this, because this seems suspect that it's not actually doing anything at all. Hmm, okay, something's wrong with this address line. That's interesting, I think that's address line three. It's sort of in the middle. Okay, yeah, something is definitely up. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna quickly check all the address lines. Four looks fine, and one more address line right here. That looks good as well. Okay, so let's check the data lines. All right, so we have a data line here, which has some activity on it, which doesn't look so bad. Stuff going on there. Let's turn it off and on and see what that does. That one looks okay. That looks okay as well. Stuff going on there. That pin is not a data line. There we go, that looks okay. That one looks all right as well, as does that one. Okay, so the data lines look okay, as do the address lines, except for three. Now, there's a bunch of things on the address lines, right? There's all sorts of stuff on this card, including the ROM and these other uh, chips here, but I'm gonna suspect that the ROM might be the problem. So we're gonna pull that chip right out of here and we can actually test this in the Retro Chip Tester Pro. Everything looks okay on here. It's not like it's uh, badly corroded or anything. All right, let's power this back on. Nope, that's still not good. Okay, so the ROM is not the problem. Could be the CPU as well. So I'm just gonna pull out the CPU and we'll substitute in another one. Why not? This computer is definitely not gonna boot properly with address line three looking like that. Why don't I just probe this pin with the CPU removed? Let's look at what that looks like. Okay, it just sort of floats there. Let's check out the adjacent ones. Okay, they're floating in exactly the same way. I think what I wanna do to try to figure out if the CPU is the problem is I'm gonna to try to drive that signal with a 460 ohm pull-up resistor to five volts. With the resistor in here, I expect to see 33 pulled high. Now, this thing supports DMA. And what that means is there is probably a transceiver on here somewhere that can disconnect the address bus from the CPU here and basically allow other things to drive the address bus. That means that certain components in the machine can talk directly to memory. And to do that, they have to take control of both the address bus and the data bus. And I don't think the Z80 has the capability of disconnecting itself from the address bus or the data bus. That is something like the 68000 can do but the 6502 cannot. Now I'm not f super familiar with the Z80, so it might be able to do that and I'm just not sure, but let's test this pull-up resistor and let's see what we got here. I gotta say this socket is looking very corroded, so that could be part of the problem right there. 
So this switch should be five volts and it is. And on this side, okay, we're getting five volts. So that's pulling up to five without any problem, which means I think this CPU might be bad. I mean, the Z80 is a very reliable chip, but certainly not out of the realm of possibility. So let me grab another one. Here's another Zilog chip. It's a Z80B from 1982. So a little bit newer than this machine. Due to how crusty and corroded this socket looks, yep, that means deoxit's going in here. Do it for the ROM socket as well. Okay, here's the spare chip. I don't actually know if this one works. I haven't tested it myself. Let's uh, pop it in, see what we get. Okay, I'm on address line three. Okay, um, well, it's better, but that's kind of low. It's just over three volts. So I wonder if there's a problem on there. Oh no, this one's the same. This is weird, this thing has sort of lower address line output. Yeah, it's only a bit over three. And the power supply is not current limiting. Let's just check um, the five volt input here. All right, I'm on the input here. Yeah, it's getting a solid five volts. And yet, why is it putting out such a low voltage here? Yeah, peak to peak is 3.5 volts. Hmm, that is a bit suspect in and of itself. Although we can see that address line is working now. So I have a feeling this CPU is a problem. I'm gonna grab another Z80. How about this lovely Italian made one? I assume this is Italian made, made by uh, SGS here, Z80B as well from, uh, well, could that be 1987? Hmm, it seems kind of late, doesn't it? Okay, here we go. Let's try this one in here. I mean, the other one might have worked, to be honest, but um, I just didn't like how low how low those signals looked. All right, let's see how this one looks. Uh, okay, better, 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 better. Peak to peak is almost five volts there, so yeah, this one's looking good. And that is the pro problematic address line, and it looks good. I'm just going to probe the other ones that are nearby. Yep, looking good. Okay, so let me power off and we're gonna reinstall this ROM. Actually, before we install this ROM again, let's try to read this out on the Retro Chip Tester Pro. 2716, which sort of profile we're gonna use because it said it was compatible. Look at that, TRS Model 8 and Model 16. So that's interesting. Uh, this is a Model 2, but maybe the ROM is exactly the same, the bootstrap ROM in both. But the fact is it read it, it did a checksum and it worked. I am just gonna dump this to the SD card. Interesting how most of it's blank. It's not even taking up that whole 2K, but whatever, we know this chip is working properly, at least uh, in the chip tester. That is cool. All right, so let's get this chip back into the board here. Now, when we power this up, I expect to see more activity on the address lines and the data bus than just that permanent repeating pattern. So let's just try this line right here. Okay, look at that. That is normal activity, folks. That is how it should look. Oh, this is so cool. So I'm gonna go out for sure and say that this original CPU, this was the one that was in there, um, and this is a bad chip. Let me get the marker. Boom, bad IC. Look at that, CPU, not what I expected. Okay, so back on the schematics, these LS240s are what send the address bus over this edge connector to the other cards. Let's check those signals. And there is also some other regular signals coming through on the LS244. And there's also some other signals that go through an LS125. But honestly, the ones I'm most concerned about are the data bus signals through these two transceivers here, the 8T26s. These are bi-directional. I'm on pin 13, which is data line 13 here in the schematics. And we turn on the power. What are we gonna see? There we go, we see activity. Good sign, that's a good sign. So a lot of the activity is gonna be relegated to on this board, right? Because it's talking to the ROMs and stuff. But then when it goes to do the RAM test, it's gonna to try to talk over this external connector to other things. So the pins I wanna look at are three, six, 10, and 13. All right, so there is pin three. We have pin six, which is, yep, that's activity. Mm, pin 10 doesn't seem to be doing anything. Might've given up. Let's power cycle it again. Hmm, pin 10. All right, well, there's a little, no, okay, there's activity. Okay, okay, we're good. 11, 12, and 13, we know 13 had activity, yep. 
Let's check this one over here. 9, 10. Okay, it's just, okay, there was a little bit there. 11, 12, 13. Okay, I'm getting a bad contact on the pin. Okay, yeah, the, the pins on here aren't rusty, but they are corroded, so I gotta scratch them a little bit. Let's see if we power it on now. There we go. Hmm, that is solid signal that's coming through there, though. Doesn't really look like I was getting on this other one. Let's scratch that one, too. Yeah, weird how that's a little bit different, how it kind of goes up and down. Hmm. Thing is, I don't really know what this is doing right now. It's probably trying those RAM tests, like I said, so I'm not really sure how it should look. Okay, yeah, well, anyways, we're getting what looks like output on those two pins, on those two chips. Because um, everything is so corroded, I'm actually gonna pull stuff out of the sockets, and the power's off right now, and I'm gonna deox it the sockets. Um, these are dual wipe sockets, so that's not terrible. If they were single wipe, I would be more concerned about issues. And I think I mentioned this in the last video, but without the ROM working, without the, the, the CPU executing code, it's not gonna initialize the CRT controller, the 6845 on the display card. And that means we're never gonna get any kind of signal out of uh, the display card whatsoever. So this is the Z80 DMA controller chip. I have no idea if this is sort of required for operation of the machine, but just in case, we will definitely hit this with the deoxit there. And then this large IC here is almost certainly, uh, does it say? I'm pretty sure this is like the serial controller used for the serial port. Okay, there we go. Everything that's in sockets has been reinserted. Let me just double check for bent pins. All the chips are in the correct orientation. Nothing is one socket off. Okay, so I think this is good to go. Let's inspect the other boards. All right, next up is this board. This is the CRT board. It's not gonna do much without uh, the CPU board connected, but what I can do is remove these four SRAM chips. These are the 2114 display chips. We could test those in the testers, make sure they're good. Uh, the bus transceivers, we can actually test those. You know what, I should have just done that. I forgot to say that this thing can actually test the bus transceiver chips. Why don't we just do that? Let's just rule them out as problematic. We'll start with these uh, sketchy ones here because these are, have rusty pins on them. If these aren't dual wipe sockets, I may end up having to swap the sockets. Oh, these are stuck in there. I'm gonna hit them with deoxit first. It's very crunchy sounding. Don't like the sound of that. Oh, and sure enough, that one got damaged a little bit. Oh, look at this. Look how bad the pins are. See all that discoloration and that black uh, color? That is corrosion on these. Now, it doesn't mean the chip is bad. These are hermetically sealed, but it's possible that corrosion can get inside the chip in the package and damage the die. Now, I can always just replace this socket, but I'm just gonna try to push it back into shape a little bit. That might be okay, maybe. How about these other ones? Will you come out without damaging the socket? Don't damage the socket. It's so crunchy sounding. That one survived a little better. Okay, that one's okay. All right, so the four bus transceivers are out. All right, over here, we are gonna look up AT26. All right, AT26, the quad bus transceiver receiver with inverting outputs. It's under miscellaneous logic IC 102. This is one of the issues on here. I'm trying to find the chip you're trying to test. Here we go, AT26, there we go. 4X bus transceivers. So let's put this first one in. Okay, that one's good. Next up, let me just quickly test all of these. That one's good. Oh yeah, okay, so all four test good. That's excellent. I'm just gonna quickly test the two that are on the CPU board here. I think these are gonna be fine as well. So might as well run this test. Yep, that's good. And the other one in the CPU board, that passes as well, sweet. All right, so back to the video board. The sockets took a little bit of a beating, taking those chips out, but it had to be done because I couldn't leave them in there like that. Uh, so I'm just using an X-Acto blade, sort of poking down on the wipes. Let's sort of push them back into position. Now that the deoxid is in there, these are going to come out much more easily next time if I need to remove them. 
All right, so these other ICs, so the 6845, I can't test this in the tester, but I do have lots of spares of those, if that's bad. The ROM chip here is almost certainly the character generator. Let's pop this out, should be able to test that. In the tester, it is most certainly gonna be probably a 2716. Let's just try that. Yep, there it is, TRS-80 Model 16. So that actually tested good as well. This thing, it's a survivor. Well, I like to think it is. I mean, I'm sounding excited. The reality is there could be so many more problems with this machine. For all I know, this machine was put out of service because it was not working. Like maybe it was stored in a garage or out in the open or wherever it was um, because it broke. And that's what ended its life. And if it's just a bad CPU, I mean, that's great and all but it could be a lot worse than that. Okay, we got SRAMs here. I'll just pop these out. These are for the video display buffer on the retro chip tester. Two one one fours are very easy to test. Okay, that one is excellent, working properly. Next. Test passed. The third one works as well. And the last one looks good. If some of the bits are bad on those chips, you end up just having like bad characters displaying on the screen, stuff like that. I had to replace, I think both or one of the 2014s on my Commodore PET, the 4016 I have. And on that one, if I recall, I put some in that I got from AliExpress and the system worked for a while without any issue. And then it started having all this weird like display corruption issues. And yeah, sure enough, those uh, ICs had gone bad again. Excellent, let's move to the RAM board. All right, so the RAM board has a ton of chips and sockets, obviously all of the DRAM here. I can test this in here. I'm not gonna bother doing that. What I can do is just remove the two bus transceivers because these are the rusty Fujitsu types. Good, that socket survived. Ooh, looks not good. And we'll test these really quick and I'll deoxid these sockets. Success. Success, both of these test good. That's a relief. I did some looking around uh, to try to buy some more of these and they're not easy to find. I think there's a way to maybe make an adapter uh, so you can use basically the 74 LS type chips, but um, it's not super easy. And I just wanted to show close up the state of the pins. I mean, just look at that, that is not good. These chips, hopefully they won't get any worse. I'm just not sure how much longer they're gonna work for. And back into the board, they go. All right, unfortunately, I apologize about the audio. My wireless mic battery died. I forgot to charge it last night and I'm really eager to test this thing out. So we're gonna use the internal microphone. When we get back to testing uh, any further, if this works or doesn't work, I will switch back to the better microphone. All right, so the computer setup here is not plugged in yet, but I have a mirror right here. So we can uh, take a look at the CRT together just to see if we see any activity on it. I have the brightness and the contrast knobs right here. So they're just lying there. I can fiddle with those to get the screen set up correctly. All three boards are in here, but the disc controller is not in here because um, I actually kind of misplaced it. It's somewhere in the basement. It's in an anti-static bag and those silver bags all look similar. So wherever it is, it's is, I'll find it. But for now, we don't need it. We're just gonna do this testing. I'm gonna connect up the power. I don't even know if it's on or off, so it might just turn on. Let's see, nope. Okay, are we ready, everyone? CRT is connected. I think we're good to go. Here we go. What's gonna happen? Whoa, hey everyone, look, look. <laughs> Let me turn down the, uh, the brightness. Oh, it's working, I can't believe it. All right, so first of all, I think I have the yoke on upside down because uh, Looks like the picture's upside down, but it does say boot error DC. That is telling us it's something, I and mean, we're getting an image. I am, I am so ecstatic, it freaking works. It was the bad CPU, well, at least to get to this point. Oh, I'm so happy. That is so cool, so cool. So before I do any further troubleshooting, I'm just gonna shut the power off here. And what I wanna do is try to find the disc controller and put that back in because it may not be booting any further because it can't find the disc. And I have a boot disc because I made it in that last disc drive video. So this thing might be so close to actually booting. Okay, time to find that disc controller card. 
All right, well, luckily the card has been found. And while I did the searching, I was breaking into some candy here. Rutger sent me these and they are very tasty Harry Bows, very unlike any of the, the type I've ever had before. I can't quite remember because it's been a little bit of time, but I think these ones come from the Netherlands, either that or Belgium. And uh, they're delicious and tasty. So they have been fueling me while I look for this card all over the basement. Yeah, I pretty much looked everywhere. Why couldn't I find the card? This is a case of putting things away for safekeeping without labeling them. This box here, which looks like maybe a 3D6SX motherboard for $2, I might add. It's not actually a 3D6SX motherboard. If we open it up, yeah, it doesn't, nothing is marked on there to make it seem like it's not. There's the card, there's the floppy controller cable. I mean, I'm really good normally with labeling stuff. I put post-it notes on everything because one of the problems down in the basement here is there's a lot of stuff down here and I need to be able to keep track of it. Otherwise I will totally misplace things left and right. Well, for whatever reason, I stuck it in here at some point after filming the previous part to this computer series and I didn't label it. So always label your boxes, especially when you think it's a motherboard. And <laughs> the worst thing is this was sitting over there on some other stuff with other motherboards in the boxes and they were stacked together. So I looked at it and thought, no, nah, those are just motherboards. I even opened the top one. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's just motherboards. Yet it was in this one. Oh, oh. Anyhow, back to testing. I think what I wanna do is power this up with the computer turned around front ways like this and just make sure that yes, I did reverse something on the CRT yoke because I think it's gonna be backwards. Let's do that first. All right, here we go, boot up number two. Let's see if we get that text like we did the first time. There it is. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> just like I thought, I have the yoke rotated 180 degrees. Boot error DC, whatever that means. That beep, by the way, was my phone. I was eating that candy, not just because I needed some fuel, but because my blood sugar is very low. All right, power this off. And I'm gonna flip the yoke around. There's not a ton of room in here to do that. Hopefully, this doesn't require some kind of full disassembly to flip this. That would be horrible. Now, uh, the card cage is in the way, but flipping this is possible. Excellent, okay. Okay, here we go. Let's try again. I do hear the CRT starting up, you know, the high voltage. That's obviously a good sign. There it is. Boot error, DC. Now, in previous testing, it seemed like the CRT was pretty good I gotta say, it's not particularly sharp, actually. It's, yeah, when you get this up to a brightness that looks acceptable, it's definitely on the soft side. So I may end up having to try to swap this out. Okay, I'm gonna make it so I can see the raster like there, and I'm going to tweak this to straighten it all out. All right, well, I'll need to do some centering work, but I'll do that later, no big deal. Let's turn the brightness back down. Okay, boot error DC. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on there. And I think I'm just gonna stick the disc controller in there because that DC, disc controller, is probably what it stands for. Now with this disc controller, and I didn't talk about this before, I don't think, I haven't gone through and reseated any of these ICs, first of all. I'm just gonna try it as is. But also on the back, there's a Zener diode that it has broken. It's no longer connected anymore. And it goes from one of the rails, I don't know, it's probably the positive rail, to a pin on the disc controller chip. Now, the strange thing is, is in the schematics, this isn't even listed. That, that doesn't exist on the schematics that I found. But I sent a picture of this over to IZ8DWF, and it turns out that the Zener goes to pin one on the floppy controller, which is an FD1791. On the data sheet for this, pin one, not connected. Pin one on this PCB has no traces going to it either, so the Zener is all that goes to it, and it does go to ground. Frank's theory is that potentially when Tandy Radio Shack implemented this design, they used this floppy controller chip. Maybe they were having a lot of them that died. They reached out to the manufacturer and said like, what's going on? We've done it according to your data sheet. And the manufacturer got back to them and said, why don't you add a 2.5 volt Zener right here? That does something. This is also obviously a little mod of some kind. I can see that there is a dip package on there and it's flipped upside down and sort of stuck on the board, soldered on with a few pins as a capacitor on there. This is also not on the schematics. So this obviously is some modification done after the fact, maybe to improve reliability on this board. Who knows? Overall, this board has seen better days. You can see it's a little crusty and corroded here on the side of that chip there. 
let's just take a look at this one here. It also has sort of green legs to it. Obviously water was running down the entire board, uh, at least on this, this section right here. So who knows if this is actually gonna work, but you know, I've seen worse like on my Field Founds Commodore 64 and it, it worked. For the pet video where I was trying to fix that spot, I ended up buying a bunch of Zeners here. Uh, so let's see what I got in here. So unfortunately that is it. I don't have anything but the 3.3. That's the smallest I have. Oh wait, I'm sorry, there's more here. 24 volts, these are from DigiKey obviously. Oh, 3.3 from DigiKey. 33 volts, 5.6 and 7.5. Okay, same problem. Well, since we're in uncharted territory here and I don't even know what this is doing exactly, I'm just gonna put a 3.3 on there and hope it's close enough. And there is my replacement bodge. 3.3 volts, but it should have been a 2.5. Hopefully that does not cause a problem. All right, so the newly bodged floppy controller is installed. I have the cable going from the drive to the controller. This is not the drive that came in this computer because this is the quieter one that wasn't exposed to all that moisture. Let's put in TRS-80 Model 2 TRS-DOS 2.0 Alpha into here. One of the disks we made hooked up to the PC in a previous part. Okay, there we go. Something's happening to my camera. I keep a battery pack connected to it and it runs for a little while and then it stops charging. So I may run out of battery soon, but we have enough battery left to power up this machine and see if it boots. I'm so excited. Just make sure everything's recording. Yes, it is. Audio is working. Here we go, everyone. Okay, insert diskette. All right. Wow, it's bright. Let me turn this down a bit. Well, that means it sees the controller, but why is it not booting? Did I leave this set to drive select one for the PC? Oh, I bet you I did. I bet you I did, but look at that, no disc controller error. Now that bar you see there, that is just the camera. It just says insert diskette. This is what it's supposed to do. Wow, exciting. Okay, turn this off. And yeah, so looking back here on the drive, I have it set for drive select one. And that was from when we hooked up to the PC. The PC expects everything to be on drive select one. This computer on the other hand expects the internal drive to be drive select zero. All right, there we go. It's on drive select zero. From a termination perspective, I don't have that external terminator connected to the back of the machine. And that's because this drive is not wired up appropriately for the termination to work that way. It actually has termination jumpers installed, so it is terminated. That means I can't plug in an external drive chassis to this thing. I'd have to take those jumpers off this drive first, and then uh, the last drive on the external chassis would be terminated. Okay, are we ready for test number two? Here we go. <laughs> Seeking noises. All right, well, it doesn't say insert diskette. Oh, oh, it's working, it's freaking working. It said 64K RAM and it's like, look. <laughs> I can't believe it, it freaking works. Left for dead and this thing is working. That is simply amazing. All the RAM passed the test. I don't, oh, I just, <laughs> I can't even believe it. I can't even believe it. TRS-80 Model 2, TRS-DOS 2.0, January 1, 1981, copyright 1981, Tandy Corporation, enter date. The keyboard, of course, isn't gonna work. There's a lot more work to do there. <laughs> but this is freaking working. Wow, 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 wow. Look at that. I wonder if this is right. Like, does it have those little symbols there? I mean, the text looks fine. It's just weird how it has little little marks on the side. I expect that to be a, a more solid, I don't know, whatever you call it. Um, okay. All right. Um, one thing that's interesting, uh, I should turn it off and on so we can see that boot up process from the very start. So let's do that. All right. There, the disk drive was initializing. So watch this. Cursor's in the center, which is funny, but hey, there you go. It will say 64K memory, which is correct. And then initializing right here. 
That's because the bootstrap ROM in here just does very minimal stuff. And then the disk is required for the rest of the initialization of the computer and the RAM check and all that stuff. Oh, I see a big dead spider right in there <laughs> that I didn't get rid of. Do you see the little, uh, little beauty in there? Oh, spider balls and guts and things. Yeah. I can't believe it. I just, I still can't believe that it works. That this, there are so many hours I put into this thing. And to think that, at least so far, nothing was actually wrong from a digital perspective except for the CPU of all things. But there it is, there's the proof. This thing is a survivor, left for dead, leaves inside, bugs everywhere, and yet, it's working. It's freaking working. Wow. All right, so I think I'm gonna end this video here. The next video, I really need to start working on that keyboard so I can try to type something on here. I need to finish cleaning up the case. That'll probably be a different video. I already kind of started because it's painted. It's sort of like a car, you know, you can use some car products on it, things like that. There were people who had good suggestions on one of the previous videos, so I'll have to go back and review those and get to that. But cosmetically, I think it can be fixed up quite a bit. There's some scuffs and stuff, but we can make it look nice and the keyboard hopefully can be made to work. And then really it's a matter of making more discs using IMD on the PC, the entire archive is there. So I can finally start playing around with this thing and see what the Model 2 is all about. Radio Shack's extremely expensive professional business machine from the late 70s. How cool is that? So if you enjoyed this video, a thumbs up would be appreciated. If you didn't, you know what to do. Um, let's see here, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Check out the second channel, I put all sorts of cool videos on there. Of course, if you haven't seen the previous parts of this series yet, there are links in the description to all of those parts. I recommend you check those out. It's been an interesting journey, so to speak, with this machine. Thanks to my patrons, their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. I appreciate all the support. And if you wanna become a patron, of course, you can do so at the link in the description below. And lastly, I'd like to thank the viewer in town here in Portland who found this thing in the trash basically and saved it to give to me so I could have this journey and share it with all of you. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the thumbnail. <laughs>